Are we ready? Yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Oh, about um, 20 years ago, no, 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 sorry, 25 years ago, five years doesn't seem that much when you're my age. 25 years ago when I was in Egypt, um, it was just before I was ordained a priest, my wife and children found a dog roaming the street. Didn't have any tag. There was not any way to find the owner. They took the dog home. And of course, being the creative people that they are, they named the dog Benji. Benji stayed with us for a long time. He was a small mixed terrier breed. And he slept with my son, Macarius. One day, um, Negwa's mother left the door open and the dog ran out. And it, it hurt me, it really hurt me a great deal. Because I always carried it in my mind. What was his end? Now, if he had been taken by a kindly family, and they had loved him and fed him and he brought them joy, couldn't be better. That's what, in fact, we had done. But what if he were hit by a car? Or partially hit by a car and was just left broken by the side of the street? This is the way my mind works. Or what if there were big dogs that were after him? and he was torn to pieces because he was in a place where he didn't belong. What if before he died from hunger the only fresh water that he had was the water pouring down the gutters and the street? Where did he go when it was hot or cold? He didn't have fleas when he was with us because we took care of that. So nothing bit him or disturbed him. I say this to you because you are that dog. You are that dog. Now I know what that means when you call Egyptians a dog, so don't hit me all at once. Reserve it until the end. The Lord said, and you have heard it prayed, how many times, O Israel, would I have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. When, when the dog ran away, he thought, I guess he was running into freedom or new experiences. That's what people in the church do all the time. If you come to the end of any service in the Orthodox Church, you will find people who could not keep their heads up, who felt that they were so oppressed by the time constraint that sleep was their first drug of choice. Yet as soon as the service concludes, they're like a rocket breaking the surly bounds of earth, leaving the gravitational pull, and going into orbit around something more exciting, more wonderful, and certainly, without a doubt, more stimulating. But to what end? But to what end? You see, we're coming to the conclusion. We're coming to the conclusion. We have the night of the apocalypse ahead of us. 
we have the blessings of bright Saturday's liturgy, and then we have the feast of the glorious resurrection of our Lord, and then we break like a stallion running its course. We break for whatever new ambition is before us. We don't say, I'm going to continue on the path that I maintained for the last seven, eight weeks. I'm going to continue this path. No, I'm going to break free. I'm going to go and I'm going to find something better. And I'm going to make up for the lost time while I was a prisoner. I want the benefits of having a relationship of Jesus Christ, but I do not want the responsibility. If you follow the course of the instructions that the Lord himself had to follow, coming from the lips of the prophet, it was incredible. It was incredible, his journey. Each tiny thing he was obedient to. I'm fond of saying you take any ghetto where you think the people are so deprived intellectually, so diminished in terms of their resources, so bereft of creativity, you take the poorest ghetto in the United States and you add two conditions of character to it and you will find that in one generation there is no longer a ghetto present. One generation only. Now what is required? First, that people obey the common knowledge that is contained within the culture. Do you imagine in any ghetto in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, that people do not tell their children to go to school, to listen, and to study? More than that, they say, when you get dirty, wash yourself. And by extension, wash your clothes and keep your house clean. There is not one culture that says, go out and get as dirty as you want, let the filth rest upon you, bring it into the house, sleep with it in your bed. And let, and let vermin have an opportunity to live with you. Rats, cockroaches, lice. That's what I mean by vermin. There's not one, there's not one culture that does that. The other thing, the other character point besides obedience of just the common knowledge. Obedience of just the common, not special knowledge. I possess special knowledge in several areas. There are things that I know in the aggregate, taking everything that is possessed in this room, I know more. Hmm? But not that kind of knowledge. Ordinary knowledge. The kind of knowledge where you could ask the least person with the least experience, the least education, and ask that person what are the right things to do in life. The second point is perseverance. In order for something to grow, you must give it time. And it must build incrementally. It must build in a way so that each layer is fixed to the previous one, in a way where there cannot be any division down the line. 
How many people have said to me that they had children that were wayward and they just don't know how it happened? They were such good students when they were young. Well, what happened? It's a lack of character, of perseverance. They were good for a while and they could not maintain it because they became ensorcelled or enchanted by something else. It may have been, as it is with most people, their inner lust. Their inner lust, their drive for whatever it is they find more creative, more wonderful, more tantalizing. They don't have to go outside. Many people say, oh, well, my, my, my son, my daughter fell in with a bad crowd. No, the bad crowd found your son. The bad crowd found your daughter. And they said, come join us. Come join us. We like the way you're going. You're going exactly the right way. You know. It's like one time a person used as an analogy a, a bunch of little sticks. And one at a time they were easily broken. But when they were gathered together in a bundle it became amazingly hard to break them. So it is with a gang or the influence of a group of people. And what is supposed to be what is supposed to be a, a, a thing unknown to the righteous takes them away. What does it say in the very first psalm? Who knows the first line of the very first psalm? I will not What, what, what are the three things he will not do? Walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Oh, no, yeah, and? Stand, in the and stand and sit. In the counsel of the ungodly. Yeah, right. Good. I will not walk by that area. I will not stand and watch what they do. And I sure as hell will not sit with them. Because sure as hell is exactly what's going to take place. Hell will take place. The beginning of the entrance into hell. And people say, oh, well, you know, he's got time. <laughs> not in my experience. Not in my experience. These are the hopes of the people that are praying for the person who died. But the guy in the box... If God is going to be that merciful, then I can tell all of you sitting here this day, you've got it made. And if that's the case, I'm thankful for God's mercy, and I am most thankful because now I'm certain to get in. But what if it's not that way? What if it's a little bit more of a pessimistic view and... The way that we behave make us seem as though we were not creations of God, not His children anymore. And what is the symbol of this? The knocking on the door of the five foolish bridesmaids. Remember, there were ten in total. Ten. Fifty percent then didn't make it. They knocked on the door. The door was locked. They begged. They said, you know us. Don't know you. Can you imagine becoming so distorted in your soul that the one who created you, your parent, doesn't recognize you? You have become so distorted, so ugly, that you can no longer be recognized. So there's that to gladden your hearts this Friday. I tell you these things because I think of myself 
I tell you every time and many times I'm repeating it because I'm being taped I say everything that I say to you to myself first I'm not looking down my nose at you most of you are taller than me anyway but I do not have any ambition beyond all of us being together eternally and we can't have that if at the first opportunity to run out of the house like a wild beast to explore things that call like a siren to Ulysses and to cause the ship that you are in to be dashed upon the rocks. Sorry for that overblown metaphor. But it's true. When we leave the church, what do we think about? What's the next move we're going to make? Do we, tr do we, is it like we have been in some contorted position while here in church? Something that feels completely unnatural, and as soon as we leave the door, we pop back into our original shape? This is the thing that the Lord gave in His incarnate example over and over and over to us so that we would have faith, so that we could build in ourselves a little backbone to take the stress and the rigidity of obedience. Remember, you can change everything in your life if you will obey the common knowledge. Not the high knowledge. The common knowledge. Are you unhealthy? There's common knowledge about health. And you don't need to go to a doctor to get it. If you've done everything that the common knowledge has offered to you, and you've been faithful, and it still doesn't work, then you need a specialist. Yes. Yes, then you need a specialist. But most of the time, the people that are sick, they don't obey the common things. I was in Egypt, and there was, at the time I was there, there was a, an outbreak of cholera. That's a real whoop de doo of a disease. And a guy came into the house, the house of Abuna Loa This is in 1981. And he had a needle. And uh, he shot to Sunni Nadia. Well, it was, you know, one of those things with an, uh, held a lot of anti cholera stuff. Then he shot Arseni, same needle. Then he shot Mira after lots of screaming and running around the house. And they said, would you like to have a shot of cholera? And I'm thinking, hmm, cholera, hepatitis, cholera, hepatitis, <laughs> cholera. I'll take my chances with cholera. Who was he shooting before he got to the house with that needle? Who? So there are some things, people, because, you know, we have disease in our church, in this diocese, where a lot of people have been infected by a lot of different things. And it comes from not having obeyed the common, the common knowledge, cleanliness. May I please have a new needle? Could you please sterilize my flesh? As best as you can. Now sometimes, again, we don't have choices. We don't have choice. I'm not talking about those people. You know, the saints did every single thing that the <coughs> Lord asked. And not many people would like to share their outcome. Now, they were happy, the saints I'm speaking about, to share that part of the Lord's passion. But most people, the common people, you and me, we wish to live 
a long and a full life. I remember those last words of Martin Luther King when he said, living a full life has, has meaning, even when it seemed that he was talking about the certitude of his own demise. Um, but yeah, I'd like to live. I, I tell people clearly, um, I'd like to live to be able to see my uh, um, my grandson, unless he goes further, I'd like to see him graduate from college. Uh, that's going to be a stretch for me, uh, because um, if he goes the way <laughs> his mother or his uncle went, you know, he's going to be taking seven years to get that B.A. But maybe that's part of the plan of God. I don't know what I'm asking for, so that when I ask and I receive, I go, wow, it was a bonus time. But yes, I, 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 I'd like to live a normal life. I'd like to live a good life now, and I'd like to be received into the bosom of the Lord later and have a good life eternally. That's what I'd like. And that's what you would all like. How do we do that? Take heart. Take heart when you see what the Lord has done. Each step in the way from His birth. Can you imagine the humility of being dragged from the place that He was born as an infant? But as God too all through Egypt, and then all the way back again? Come on. That wouldn't be fun. That wouldn't be fun. There was no sure control of the temperature like there is in a normal home. There was no certainty about how much water was available, so how often could he have received a bath? You remember... He was a human being like all human beings and the Lord had need as a baby of being bathed daily. And you know, going through the desert, it's hard to maintain that kind of care. So as a baby, he experienced hardship. His birth his birth, just his birth. So as he grows up and, and, and he announces himself and he gathers disciples and people start to follow him after hearing the word that he has preached and seeing the miracles starting with the wedding, the wedding uh, in Cana of Galilee, he was obedient and obedient and obedient and obedient. I came to do not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. In your life, you know there were times when your parents told you to do something and you didn't do it. You did not do it. And they hadn't told you anything wrong. Maybe it was what you just didn't want to do at the moment. But you said, I have another idea. And I have free will. And I'm going to pursue that. Okay. So you did. But what did you get from it? Some of you, if not you particularly, you know someone who because they disobeyed, they had a very bad experience. A very bad experience. It may not have cost them their reputation because it may have been hidden. It may have not cost them anything as a permanent physical marker because they escaped because of medicine or the, uh, the clever and skillful hands of a physician who knew how to help. But I tell you, and I tell you without pride, 
that just as you could correct any festering situation in any society, I'm talking about a ghetto, if you have just two character references that will not yield to temptation, you can do anything. Did you read the, 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 the book called The Outliers? Okay. $10,000. That's all that's required. You put in your 10,000 hours and you become a genius. People think the, the Beatles, for example, were a, an overnight success. It says in the book that they toiled, living most of the time in the back of a van. And remember, it was John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And you can just know that Ringo was a bean eater. Seven years they played in Germany in crummy little venues. Seven years they honed their act. Seven years they wrote songs. Sometimes they, the only thing that they got was a little money for their next lunch. And they had one meal until they came to the next night because sometimes it was past the hat time. The Beatles. Bill Gates, Bill Joy, all these people that have done amazing things, they just put in their 10,000 hours. They were just obedient. Somebody said, you should take step A, integrate it, then go to step B, integrate and collate, Go to step, step C, put it all together and extrapolate, and just keep doing that. Well, if you work three hours a day, you know, approximately 10 years. Can you imagine going to school and just study three hours a day for 10 years? Do you think? Do you think that it's going to be possible for you then to go back to a situation in your own society, be comfortable with it, or do you think that you will use that as the engine that drives change? And if everybody did it, there'd be no Puerto Rican ghetto, Mexican ghetto, African American ghetto, there'd be who... Who do you want to pick on? Everything would change if you just are obedient and obey the common knowledge. The common knowledge. Now, if you, if you come to the end, then there's the extra knowledge. But in Jesus Christ, as He is giving us a way to look at our own lives by being the template against which we measure every single human characteristic, when you come to that, look to Him. Beg Him. Say, Lord, my God, my Father, I'm struggling. I wish to obey. I wish to be successful. I wish to follow Your example. Help me. Help me. Put someone in my path that can guide me and he will I'll be responsible for that statement you can come to me you can come to me if you know anyone who's asking that question legitimately I can put them in front of somebody that will help them with a phone call I promise whoever is watching this tape Send the scummiest person you know to my front door. I'll change them if they have the will to change. It's easy. You obey the common knowledge and you persevere into it till you reach the level where you have success as defined by the one that made you. Some people think they're successful, you know, when they collect. There was a guy, I, I, left, I left the house today, 
and it's illegal what this guy is doing. I would never blow the whistle on a real poor guy. He's got a shopping cart and he's got two giant trash bags and it's trash day in my street. So while it's trash day, he will go through the recycling bins and pull out every single aluminum can that he has. Now, the company that picks this up hates that, wants him persecuted because it's cutting into their profit margin. When you recycle all that stuff, you help them out and they send it on down the line. That's why they pay a dollar and 35 cents for aluminum cans. They can pay you a buck thirty-five because they're making well more than a dollar thirty-five. And it goes on down the line. So this poor person has no job, has no skills, probably has no language whatsoever to exist in Southern California, outside of, say, Huntington Park. This guy has but this one thing. Now maybe he feels successful. Maybe where he came from, it was so bad that now he's happy. Man, I've got my own four-wheel cart. I stole it, but I got my own four-wheel cart. And I go around every morning, it's good, the air is good and clean, it's early, there's not a lot of pollution because of the cars haven't got out yet. And I go around and I've got gloves on and I just pick out that stuff. It's like free money. You know, it takes what about twelve cans to make a pound? Twelve pound, buck thirty-five. <laughs> you know how, long, how fast I can I can pick out twelve cans of trash? And he just walks. So he's not going to die of a heart attack, even though he probably eats really lousy food. He's got something good. So I'm not I'm not saying that you define success in that guy's terms. I'm saying that you define success according to how the Lord made you. And do you know what? If you want to know what the Lord thinks of you and how much He loves you, think about the gifts that He has given you. Now some people are going to say, but I'm ugly. I'm, I'm short. I, oh, I wanted to be a foot taller than I am. You're looking at things that are commonplace that society has rendered its verdict on. Uh, maybe you know this or you don't know this. If you are a doctor of sport, at least it used to be this way, in uh, the Soviet Union, a doctor of sport was uh, something that was granted people that had been uh, very well rewarded in competition such as the Olympic Games. If you uh, had gold medals in the Olympic Games, you lived in the best district, in the best apartments, and your pay to be a doctor of sport was about three times higher than being an MD. Okay? We, we have this kind of thing too in professional sports. For them, um, there weren't any professional sports, it was just amateur sports which is why that famous line came out of Al Michaels' mouth in 1980 at Lake Placid, Do you believe in miracles? Because a bunch of college-aged hockey players were playing against the greatest sportsmen in hockey in the Soviet Union, and America beat them. America beat them. And, and well, you can imagine what happened to that coach. And the players, they were threatened because of poor performance. But these gifts that, that, that seem so dramatic, like if I just had a voice, if I just had a great voice and I could sing, I could make all this money, people would throng to me. No, 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 no. That's not how you count the gifts that I'm talking about. Because those you don't take to bed with you at night. Oh, I guess some crazy people sing in their sleep, <laughs> but, you know, and uh, the only thing I ever heard with regard to people having good height was it was hard to get a good night's sleep because everywhere they went, the bed was too small. That's why Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, ex-center for the Lakers, former center for the Milwaukee Bucks, he used to get the very first seat 
in every airplane flight because he could never stretch out his legs. Huh. So some, you know, you will, you will, if you're six foot seven as I wished to be, or six foot eight, I would not feel comfortable in a Honda. <laughs> uh, I can go on and on and on. Look, the, the, the thing that I wish to tell you is that when we count the gifts that the Lord has given us, do, do you know one of the things that I prize most that He has given me is an appreciation for beauty. Now, I myself am not beautiful, and I don't think there's going to be any objection about that. But the Lord has given me an appreciation, an aesthetic that is beyond, way beyond. Some people call it taste. But I possess it. Maybe it's the uh, distribution of rods and cones in my eyes, and the way that I sense color. Maybe it's the way in which my mind sees geometry and sees symmetry and prizes symmetry. Maybe the line and the flow that we find melodically in music is something that I have because of an advantage that God gave me orally. A-U, not O-R. Orally. I don't know but I know I have it in an abundance. And I know that when I'm listening to something, if I have never, if I have never had any experience with it before, ever, I can tell what's good and what's not good. I went to a, 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 a restaurant in Little India. It's called Ambala Sweets. I've taken some people there. There's a record store near there. And I went and I, I'd never heard of any of these people. They're all from India or Pakistan. And I got this CD from Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan. Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan, Pakistani. And he plays Kuala music. Anybody here? Raise your hand. You know what Kuala music is? Okay. Besides him. <laughs> He's never known. <laughs> he just likes to raise his hand. He's, he's in dealt work. Kuala music. You've heard me talk about it, that's all. But I didn't, I didn't know who I was listening to. I didn't have to. It was beautiful. Now for some of you it's going to be quite offensive when I tell you what kind of music it is. It's the very spiritual music of Islam. Huh. The very spiritual, and you don't think Islam is spiritual, you're wrong. They're wrong in their theology, but in the outward trappings, they have the dervishes. Have you seen the dervishes dance? Have you seen it? Who else does this? Who else? Any other culture? Any other religious confession does it to have competition? No. No. There are plenty of people that play rock and roll. Japanese play rock and roll. Germans play rock and roll. Everybody plays rock and roll. Anybody play quality music? No. No. But you don't need to be told you should like this if your own system of filtration tells you it's good. I will never be with Andrew Zimmern for a meal because I don't want to eat worms and grubs and monkey brains and things that he finds under rocks and I'm not likely to eat with that other guy called man versus food I don't remember what his name is but you see those people have become famous because 
they are attempting to events, events, show forth, to manifest a gift that really isn't in them. <clears throat> As I said, this is why your Creator will look at you at the end of the day and say, you have so distorted yourself, I don't know who you are. Who wants to eat a worm? Now, having said that, I've eaten two worms, live worms. But I did it as a part of a kind of a ritual. It was not flavorful. I won't do it again. And I do not advise anybody to follow in my footsteps. But I did, it was a, a, an Indian, an American Indian. And he, it was part of a thing. And I said, okay. Real story. So, you can distort yourself. Hey, let's go smoke shisha. There's something that plays. Have you ever heard or thought of anything more stupid than somebody putting a rolled up bunch of dead vegetation and lighting one end and breathing it into their lungs? Were your lungs made for that, I ask you? No. That's why I say the habits that you are running out of the church in order to get to distort you so badly that God doesn't know who you are anymore. And we have, I just picked on some very obvious things, things that might bring a smile, things that might um, play to the crowd. I could bring things that were much more subtle and much more pernicious, dangerous, hurtful. But I say to you, the Lord showed you His obedience. The Lord showed you His persistence. Obedience and persistence will bring you anything. Because you know what? Someone's going to fall off by the wayside. And if you simply persist... <coughs> I can't remember who um, the guy is now. He was a runner from um, an eastern country. Eastern European country. One of the greatest distance runners of all time was, was, was a man named Emil Zatopek. Emil Zatopek. And he ran the 5,000 and the 10,000. And when he ran the 5,000 and 10,000, nobody beat him for three Olympics. That span. No one beat him. And the guy that he ran with and the guy that loved him, he loved him so much, he loved the Olympic Games so much he named his daughter Olympia. Not Emil Zatopek, this other guy. I don't, I'm, I'm so ashamed that my memory will not allow me to say his name. Um, he always came in second. And they were running in the fourth Olympic Games. And he's running next to him and he's going, Go! Go, Emil! He's expecting him to kick, as he always did. Like, go, it's your time to get the glory. I've got three, I've got three silver medals. Emil couldn't go any further, and it almost broke the guy's heart. And he went off, and he won that Olympic gold medal. The guy simply persisted. It doesn't matter where genius lies. If the man doesn't have persistence, he will not win. Genius helps you, like a big rocket, to move something very quickly. But you need that second stage. <coughs> and once you have broken the hold on gravity that it has on you, once you have broken that, that that, that, that clenched fist, you soar. That's what the Lord wanted to have us live as. Free men, running free, running within the bounds of the house that He made for us where there was every good thing. We have lots of kids in our church saying this, the people on the internet. Uh, I don't have more than that to say. It applies as much to me as to you. 
If God gives me the time that I wish so that I can live to see my grandson through college, then hopefully I will perform in a way that I will complete some of the things that were expected of me that I didn't fulfill. Uh, it's not God's responsibility because I've already had sufficient time. If I judge myself now, I am a failure. I am a failure. I have not met the promise that was within me, that was given to me as a gift. But I hope, and uh, if you will pray, I hope that will change. I, I wish for that. And I wish that all for you. I, I, I wonder what happened to Benji. He was such a sweet little dog. Benji. People are going to say that. You ever remember anybody in high school? You always say, I wonder what happened to that guy. Maybe, maybe, maybe grammar school. Go back a little further when people were cuter and they, 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 they hadn't the ability to be quite as devastating in their nastiness. You ever wonder what happened to that person? Where are they now? Hope they're doing well. My first girlfriend, five years old, Walnut Creek, California, Sharon Pelosi. I wonder what she's doing. She was so sweet. Huh? It's like that. People will say that about us when we have not fulfilled the promise and when we have been lost. I hope that isn't about um, the end of any of our biographies. Glory be to our good Father and His Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.